to you all in the master's name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this evening, once again, we are gathering together in the presence of God to uh, uh, listen the word of God. Even uh, I welcome every one of you, especially uh, dear Jewel, also is joining with us again from Arizona, is it? Okay, so he, she just went to the college and uh, she's joining from there. Thank you, Jewel, for joining and you, uh, thank God for your interest also for this Bible study. And uh, I welcome every one of you and uh, as we are gathering together, let us sit in the presence of God with a prayerful attitude so that uh, we'll be able to, I mean, uh, see uh, the wonder-working hands of God and uh, the mysteries of the Word of God. So this evening, let me ask you something that, uh, uh, what was the uh, previous portions that we were covering in the previous class? How many of you remember that portions? Can any one of you say the portions which we already covered? We talked about the introduction of the book of Revelation. Um, the, the, you want to know the whole thing? <laughs> and we talked about Apostle John. Yeah. I mean, the purpose of the book about um, then what? All the, then we talked about the importance of the letters and epistles okay. and the kinds of struggles. And why seven churches were chosen, okay. and specific features of uh, Revelation, of the Book of Revelation. Okay. In that, uh, uh, I was just talking about the structure of uh, uh, seven letters. The structure yeah. of seven letters. Yes. And also three views on seven letters. Yes. Right? Yeah. Three views on seven letters. So mainly there are three uh, views on the seven letters so that was the i think that was the last portion that we were yeah. discussing okay yes. so the first vision uh, first view is uh, uh, these letters were written uh, only for the seven local churches mm -hmm. and the second view was dispensational application okay dispensational application means these letters were written only Century. for the the, the, the the period of time the churches mm -hmm. in which they were having so we have seen uh, that periodical, I mean, uh, differences between the seven churches and all those things uh, from up to up to Laodicea, and also the third view was the global application. Okay, so we are, I mean, uh, here here in that point, and uh, I mean, I would like to tell you that we will be, I mean, uh, uh, taking that third view as uh, uh, as the application for ourselves. You know, uh, it is that seven letters, the messages which is. Uh, uh, written in those seven letters are applicable for all the churches from the first century uh, to the rapture of the church. Amen. So let us take all those points and there are the, uh, the the truth and mysteries of the word of God in book of Revelation uh, uh, towards the all the churches of the present uh, time. So now we will uh, go to the next special future. Okay. Uh, the specific futures of the, uh, the main heading was uh, specific futures of the book of Revelation. Uh, in that, the next point is the symbolic language. Symbolic language. Okay. So, you know, there are many uh, specific futures we can see from the, the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, you know, we were thinking about uh, what the structure of the seven letters and the importance of the lectures and also the views about these seven letters and all those things. Now we will come to the next point that is symbolic language. Okay, uh, symbolic language in Malayalam it is Pradigatmagamaya. Uh, Pradigatmagamaya, Kairingale Kurisu Samsarikina, symbolic language. Okay, you know, that means most difficult uh, book to understand in the New Testament. You know, uh, these things, you know, when we speak something about the symbolic language, uh, uh, that is something like, uh, uh, which is very, very difficult to understand. Uh, there are many 
points and there are many things written in this book of revelation uh, like the symbolic language symbolic languages is is used in this uh, i mean a uh, book of revelation in in different places with uh, our uh, limited intellectual uh, capacity uh, it is not i mean uh, able to understand but we need the power of the holy spirit and we need uh, the presence of god to understand the symbolic language and uh, the meaning of those i mean mysteries of the book of revelation so uh, use of symbolic i mean uh, for example you can see there are many uh, uh, colors used symbolic colors and symbolic metals and symbolic garments are used in uh, different places in book of uh, uh, revelation i will give you uh, one or two uh, verses from this chapter 1 chapter 1 verses 13 to 16 chapter 1 verses 13 to 16 says like this and in the middle of the lamp stands is so one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and guarded across his chest with a golden ash and and that one and also uh, maybe chapter 3 verse 18 chapter 3 verse 18 says uh, i advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and i slave to anoint your eyes so that you may see so these are the two verses yes i pick uh, to 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 prove that i mean there are many symbolic languages used in the book of revelation okay just like the color or the metal or the garments or something okay and also the numbers also are interesting in the book of hebrews uh, but difficult to i mean uh, spiritualize you know uh, sometimes Uh, the numbers we are trying to spiritualize that is not uh, easy but uh, it is to understand uh, what is the real meaning of that uh, numbers used uh, in in the in the in, in the book for example you know uh, we are reading uh, from uh, uh, maybe uh, i mean uh, from chapter 6 there are seven seals and also uh, we are reading about uh, i mean seven uh, trumpets in chapter 8 okay so these numbers maybe 7 or 8 or something that numbers is important but we have to i mean uh, take it as a literally okay and for example in uh, uh, chapter 5 verse 6 also revelation chapter 5 verse 6 also it says and i saw between the throne uh, and the elders a lamb stand as if slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent out into all the earth okay so jesus christ is described as a lamb of god here jesus christ is described as a lamb of god here in fact jesus uh, jesus is not a lamb but just pictured as a lamb to show the spiritual benefits that we receive from jesus through the death of jesus christ or through the blood of jesus christ this is called the symbolic language okay when we read about jesus that jesus is the lamb of god that doesn't mean that jesus is a lamb literally that doesn't mean that jesus is a lamb but what it speaks about when we speak about jesus as the lamb in bible especially in the book of revelation we are thinking about what is the spiritual benefit that we are receiving from the from the death and the blood shed of jesus christ on the cross of calvary so that is the that is the meaning of the symbolic languages in the, the book of I mean, revelation now the next one next feature next feature is complicated and controversial topics are there okay there are many complicated and controversial topics in book of revelation for example uh, i i i can tell you that you know there are many people believing that uh, uh, the the tribulation will be happening before the rapture and some people believe that the 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 tribulation will be happening after the rapture okay so there are many kinds of uh, uh, views about many things that is controversial subjects okay and also the complicated subject 
you know, uh, with one word we cannot conclude, a, uh, make a conclusion for that. At the same time, we will be going through all those portions, maybe about the second coming of Jesus and the, um, what is that, the tribulation, seven years of tribulation period and uh, the thousand year of millennium, millennium and the rapture of the church and uh, the judgment of the believers or judgment of the wicked people and all those things will be covering. At the same time, just understand that there are many uh, subjects and there are many talks which is very complicated and uh, controversial topic which uh, I mean already the scholars and the theologians have I mean uh, 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 thought about all those things and they uh, they uh, every one of them came to a, a conclusion in their own views okay so we'll be looking into it later and the and next one is a uh, huge number of visions and the dreams are there in this book. Huge number of visions and dreams are there in this book. So in visions, he is using many symbolic matters. Okay, in vision, whenever he, uh, Apostle John was uh, just watching the vision or the dream, he is just using some symbolic matters. But we cannot take many of the symbolic and allegorical usages realistically. You know, there are many people who are taking all the uh, all the symbolic language and symbolic visions or allegorical usages as literally, literally or realistically. But we should not take all those things as it is. But we have to find out what is the spiritual meaning and what is the intention of God and what is the intention of Apostle John, the author of the book of Revelation. Anyway, there are many huge number of visions and dreams in this book. So we have to be seeing, I mean, we have to be, I mean, very careful about all those things. And also next usage is the allegorical language from the Old Testament. The allegorical languages from the Old Testament. There are many things which is allegorically written and taken from the Old Testament in this book, especially from the prophetical books, especially from the prophetical books, like uh, the book of Ezekiel, book of Daniel, and book of Zechariah. Okay, so what, what you can call it as in allegorical means, uh, uh, Sadrishim, okay, as an example, or, uh, uh, okay, Drishtandam or Sadrishim or something. Okay. Uh, so you can take in that way, allegorical language. So many things are taken from the Old Testament prophetical books like Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah. And he is just, I mean, making some uh, meaning about all those things from the Old Testament. So that is one of the speci uh, specific features of uh, the book of Revelation. And the next one is vindictive language. Vindictive language. Vindictive, uh, vindictive language is uh, in Malayalam. It is pradigara chovayulla oru oru bhasha. Pradigara chovayulla. Lengil revenge dekanda mone ulla oru bhasha. The the language of revenge. The language of revenge. That is called the vindictive language. Uh, Okay, so it is a it is a language of revenge. Maybe uh, when you read uh, chapter six, verses nine and ten, you no know, Revelation chapter six, verses nine and ten. Anyone of you can read chapter six, verses nine and ten. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. Yes. First. Okay. Okay. It, it, is, it is very hard to understand. You know, vindictive language is very hard to understand. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar uh, uh, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained all those things you know when uh, somebody is using or, or when john was john is using the the, the kind of uh, vindictive uh, uh, language it is it is very hard to understand so that language also is there 
in this book and they cried out with a loud voice saying how long O oh lord holy and true will you refrain from judging and aven avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth okay so uh, that that speaks about the revenge of god revenge of god so that kind of language also is used in this book and the next one is chord languages chord languages chord languages that also is used in this in this book for example uh, chapter 13 uh, verses 1 and 2 chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 yeah okay anyone of you can read that verse chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns. Yeah. And on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Okay, listen there, you know, in these verses, we can see that, you know, as, uh, he is, I mean, uh, speaking, are uh, using a chord language, you know, it is very difficult to understand, chord language, you know, uh, used the names of, of some beasts and animals, okay, names of some beasts and animals, and, uh, I mean, we should not take that, I mean, names of the animals or the beast literally, that a, a beast is going to come out, uh, come, come out of the sea. Okay, rather there are there are some spiritual revelations and meanings of the things going to happen. Okay, so that is the that is the meaning of that. And uh, you know we cannot take the, those verses literally. You know, uh, uh, maybe uh, you you can see one uh, slide about uh, the the beast which is coming uh, out <coughs> of the sea. Uh, there is there is one picture of the uh, the beast with the seven yeah seven heads and ten horns will. Will be, will be there. Seven heads and ten horns. Yeah. Did you see that? Okay. The same. The same beast is written in chapter thirteen, verse uh, uh, verses one and two. Okay. And the drag. Okay. Uh, is it? Is that that one? The beast. Okay. Yeah. Thirteen verse. Uh, and the dragon stood on the. I mean sand of the seashore then i saw a beast coming out of the sea having 10 horns and seven heads and on his horns were 10 dance so all these things when you read you have to understand this is the chord language you know we should not take it as a literally uh, as literally but we can take it, it as a spiritual meaning you know why why uh, i mean john is using the chord language let us see that why uh, he is using the chord language. There are some reasons to 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 use the chord language, like you know, uh, number one, to to protect, to protect the churches. You know, the churches were going through severe persecution. So why John is using the chord language when he is writing the Revelation? The first one is to protect them, to protect them, the churches, because they were going through the severe persecution. So remember, so if the outsiders receive this letter, they will create some other problems with the Christians. You know, they should not understand what is the meaning of this, but the Christians will understand. The believers will understand, or the or the leaders of the church will understand what is the meaning of this. Okay, but it should not reach to the outside people because already the Christian people, the Christianity, were going through the persecution. So at the same time, if they are reading these letters, that the, the persecutors who are reading these letters, they will think that, okay, oh, if this is the meaning of this, then we will make some other problems with the, the, uh, the Christian. So that's the reason to protect the Christians, John is using many kinds of called languages to protect the Christians, okay? 
and secondly to connect with the old testament to connect with the old testament for example there are almost 400 references of revelation indicates to the old testament events okay almost 400 references of revelations indicates to the old testament events so that is one of the reason that for that, that john apostle john is using the called languages because he is i mean speaking something related to the old testament events there are 400 references of revelation indicates to the old testament events the next next reason of using the uh, called languages to let them know the seriousness to let them know the seriousness for example if it is written in in plain language nobody will take it seriously is that right if it is written in plain language simple language nobody will take it seriously but john is writing all these things in a different way so that the people will be very much serious about all these things for example chapter 12 verses 3 and 4 chapter 12 verses 3 and 4 it says then another sign appeared in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and horn his heads were seven diadems okay so and in verse 4 and his tail swept away the a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth he might devour her child okay so when you read that that verses verses 3 and 4 of chapter 12 a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and all those things are written i mean elaborated there why john is using these kinds of chord language why john is bringing a beast or a dragon in front of them and showing that okay this is going to happen okay a great red red i mean a red dragon with the seven heads and ten horns okay that that picture you can see there now you can see that yeah why why john is i mean bringing all these things into into the into the attention of uh, the people i mean those who are going through the persecution because they have to understand the seriousness the seriousness of the things that which is going to come the seriousness of the things which is going to come you know for example if uh, uh, if the letters or if the book of revelation is uh, written plainly or the, in, a, in a simple language okay all the people will read that and they will just leave it away, leave it away they will not be taking uh, all the words of the book of revelation seriously so that's the reason when when they are reading about these things they will be eagerly waiting to know what is the meaning of this and what is going to happen in future and what is to come what and how it is going to happen okay it, it, it is it is very danger and we have to be ready for the second coming of jesus christ of course they were waiting for the second coming of jesus christ at the same time when they are reading these letters they are understanding okay there are many things which is going to happen but we have to be ready for the second coming of jesus christ to make them serious to make them serious john was writing in a, in a court language and using some of the beast or dragon like this that the picture like that you know whenever they see that one they will understand well, how serious is the, the matters which is going to come even you know jesus also used many parables and comparisons in his sermon whenever he, he was speaking the sermon and he was giving the uh, messages to the to the to the disciples he was always using some kind of parable and he was, I mean, taking some kind of metals or some kind of object, or some uh, uh, maybe sometimes he was taking a, taking a child, infant, and using uh, that child to to give the clear picture about the real truth of the Bible. 
So in Jesus' mind, it was there why he was using that. Let the people know the importance of the biblical truth. Let the people know the importance of the biblical truth. That's the reason that Jesus also used many parables and comparison while he was giving the sermons. Okay, then next we will come to the similarities in letters. Similarities in letters. Similarities in letters means, you know, there are many similarities in uh, the other writings of John with the book of Revelations. Okay, this is one of the, this is one of the, spe I mean, specific features of uh, uh, the book of Revelation. What is that? The similarities in letters. You know, which are the other letters, which are the other letters of uh, John, Apostle John, or which are the other, other books of John? Gospel of John, Gospel of John, First John, Second John, Third John, then the Book of Revelation. Okay, so there are many similarities in other writings of John with the Book of Revelation. For example, you can compare with, uh, I mean, Revelation chapter nineteen, verse thirteen. Revelation chapter nineteen, verse thirteen. Here it says, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God, the word of God. And also John chapter 1 verse 1, John chapter 1 verse 1. What is that? It is by heart. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay. So Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word or Jesus is the word of God. Both in his gospel, in gospel of John, and also in the prophetical book, book of Revelation, he is writing about Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the word. Same time. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 says like this. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders and lamb standing as if slain having seven horns. Another other other one, John chapter 1, verse 29. John 1 29. It says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So who is Jesus there? Who is Jesus there? Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Okay, so in, in Revelation chapter 19 verse 13, Jesus is the Word. And John chapter 1 verse 1, Jesus is Word. Same time, Revelation 5, 6, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And same letter written by John, the, the Gospel of John written by Apostle John, it says Jesus is the Lamb of God. So these are the main features and and these are the main reasons that I mean, Apostle John was I mean, uh, using many kinds of uh, allegorical or inductive or I mean, uh, what is it, symbolic or uh, uh, the, 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 the chord language or something in his book. So these are the, uh, some of the main features of the book of Revelation. Now we will uh, go to the next heading that is the word apocalypse. The word apocalypse. The word apocalypse. <clears throat> the word apocalypse is a Greek word. It is written there in Greek also. If you want to draw that, you can draw it down. You cannot write that, you can draw that. Or take a picture of that. Apocalypse. You know which is the first letter of that? Greek. In Greek, Apocalypse. First letter of Greek. Alpha. Alpha. 
and the last one omega omega it's very easy alpha beta gamma delta epsilon like that okay so alpha is the first one so that is the that is the, this is the alpha that a it comes there no alpha. okay then uh, we will go to the explanation of that word you know the, the book of revelation in the new testament has the literal title in greek that is the apocalypse of john okay the book of revelation in new testament has the literal title in greek it is written the apocalypse of john the apocalypse of john so the word apocalypse means revelation the word apocalypse means revelation which means which means unveiling the mysteries unveiling the mysteries or revealing the hidden things revealing the hidden things or unlocking the facts unlocking the facts and the other meaning of revelation or apocalypse is to pull the lid of something to pull the lid of something that means opening something and revealing some mysteries or unveiling the mysteries or revealing the hidden things or unlocking some of the facts okay this is the meaning of the word apocalypse or revelation you know apostle john received many revelations about jesus christ and revelations about the seven churches and the visions about the eschatological events you know that is what we read in book of revelation Apostle John, when he was <clears throat> banished to Patmos, island of Patmos, from there he was receiving many kind of revelation from Jesus Christ. So the first revelation was about Jesus Christ himself. He got the revelation about Jesus Christ, that is in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 1. And the revelation about the churches, the seven churches, and also the, 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 the universal churches. And also many visions about the eschatological events. That means what is going to happen uh, in the future. In the future, the the last events. You can call it as the last last events or future events. Okay. So that's why this book is known as the Book of Revelation or Apocalypse. Okay. So that's the reason because he received many revelations about Jesus Christ and all uh, about the churches and about the future things or the future events. That's the reason this book is known as the apocalypse or the revelation that means i mean i mean uh, unveiling something or unlocking the mysteries or something that's the meaning of that word so we need to uh, uh, think about you know how we can get into these things if it is a mystery if it is a mystery you know if it is something which is locked and if we want to know the meaning and the spiritual meaning of these portions we need the power of the Holy Spirit and we need the help of the Holy Spirit to grasp the depth of the prophecies of this book. So let us pray that God may give us wisdom and understanding and the help of the Holy Spirit to grasp the truth. So let me remind you something about uh, uh, the, the, the reasons of, of, of the I mean, destruction of Christian churches in Turkey. You know, uh, last class, uh, Justin was uh, asking a question about uh, that, that thing that, you know, uh, why uh, that happened and why it is written like that, all those things. So uh, let me tell you something about that thing also. You know, why and, and the, what are the reasons of the destruction of Christian churches in, in, in Turkey? You know, I told you all, already that uh, in the beginning, there were many churches in turkey not only in turkey in different areas especially in asia minor there were many churches at the same time after few days after few years that all the churches were banished and it was not there it was banished from there disappeared from there you know christians have gone down and uh, i mean there were many 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 islam muslim people they came and they captured that area and the, let us see what are the reasons the reason 
of the destruction of the Christian churches in, in Turkey. In Turkey, you know, uh, we see also the growth of the Islam religion in that country also. You know, as we uh, get into the first chapter of this book, uh, 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 and and I have already given you the the brief history about the invasions and religious influence which uh, destroyed the Christianity in Western Turkey. Already we have discussed about all those things in the previous class. How uh, the, the the history says about the invasions. Okay, uh, which are the group and which are the countries they captured this place and how they were influencing these Christians. Okay, and the religious influence of uh, the people and how I mean they destroyed the Christianity in that in that area. But still, I mean uh, uh, we have to think about some more things about what happened in those places, what happened in those places, and what is the what what are the reasons of uh, the destructions of the christian churches in that area okay the first reason is persecution the first reason is persecution you know the main thing it was persecution they mean uh, all the christians were under severe persecution in those days there are many reasons for that and uh, i mean many emperors were persecuting the christians there and uh, i mean uh, that is one reason that uh, the church is destroyed you no know? because of the persecution they were not able to stand firm and all the churches were destroyed and uh, uh, they came into even even the roman emperors even the roman emperors they came inside and they just made something i mean i mean defeated all the christianity uh, i i tell you i mean who all are the the the, the i mean roman emperors who invaded uh, that area and destroy the churches. The first emperor, Roman emperor, was uh, okay. Uh, for, before that, let me tell you the Caesar Caesar worship. Caesar worship was uh, one of the one of the religions during the time of Apostle John and Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a was a Roman uh, a emperor, and uh, I mean uh, that emperor. I mean in that time he was doing something like. Uh, I mean, uh, we were we okay. They, he said, "Okay, I'm I'm starting the Caesar worship. That means you should not worship any other god. You have to worship me." He said, "Okay, Caesar. I mean, Julius Caesar said you have to worship me." So Caesar worship started in his time. That was the, that that also was a uh, reason of the persecution. Okay, and the I mean, and the Caesar worship came, became the universal religion also of the Roman Empire. It, it was a universal religion in the Roman Empire. So then, after the Caesar, after the uh, Roman Emperor Caesar, the next one was the Augustus. <clears throat> Augustus. The next one was Augustus, and he allowed the Caesar worship again. Okay. Caesar Julius Caesar died, and after him, the next Roman Emperor was Augustus. So Augustus also encouraged the people to worship Caesar. That means Caesar worship. He was encouraging and he was allowing the people to worship the Caesar. Then the next one, next emperor was Tiberius. Tiberius. The next emperor was Tiberius. But what happened in his time? In his time, he discouraged the worship of Caesar. He said, "You should not worship Caesar, but you can worship any other god, what you like." He was saying, "Caesar is not at all a god. You should not worship Caesar." That was his conception. And the next one was Caligula. Caligula was the next Roman emperor. The next Roman Emperor Caligula. What happened? He attempted to place his own images in the Jerusalem temple. It is very serious, you know. This man, the Roman Emperor Caligula, he was trying or he was attempting to place his own image in the Jerusalem temple, but he could not proceed. He could not do that because of the opposition. Of the Jews and other people, he could not do that. He was trying for that, but he could not do that. 
But the next emperor, the next Roman emperor was Claudius. 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 Again, he allowed the people to worship their own gods. Their own gods. Claudius was the next emperor of Roman emperor. He allowed people to worship their own gods. Whatever it may be, whoever it may be, you can worship your own gods. That was the time. It was till AD 53. But the next emperor came. Next emperor name is Nero. Nero came in AD 54. His timing was from AD 54 to 68. AD 54 to 68, Nero, the emperor, the, the Roman emperor. From his time, the severe persecution started on Christians. I know many of you will be aware about uh, the, the, the persecution which happened there in, during the time of Nero and Domitian. Okay, so now we will think about the Nero. He was the he was the next uh, I mean Roman emperor. From his time onwards, the severe persecution started on Christians, and he did. Uh, he did not insist them to worship Caesar also, but he was putting all uh, all the blame on Christians uh, in in great fire on the Rome. That is one one of the main reason that uh, Christianity was going down. You know, uh, it was it was in it was in AD 64. It was in AD 64. Nero, uh, he himself. I mean, uh, burned the Roman city. He himself burned the Roman city. And then what happened? He was just, I mean, I mean uh, accusing all the blame and putting all the blame upon the Christian people. You know, uh, you, you can see that that, I mean, burning of the, of the I mean, Jerusalem, uh, burning of the Roman city in the slide. Okay. So that is the, that is the I mean, uh, great fire which came on the Roman city by uh, the Emperor Nero. What happened? Nero began to persecute the Christians and he was blaming them for great fire in Rome in AD 64. You know, he himself, I mean, was encouraging the people to put the fire on the Roman city uh, and he was, I mean, persecuting all the people, all the Christians, and some were dressed in fears and to be killed by dogs and some others uh, were crucified still others were uh, set on fire although some persecutions of christians is believed to have occurred and some it was very cruel it was a cruel situation it was a crisis for the christian people during the time of the emperor nero so the extent of it has been widely exaggerated and you know uh, even though he did it and all the blame came upon the Christian people and the Christian churches. And he said, Nero said, okay, this is done by the Christians. This burning or this great fire is done by the Christian people. So we have to kill the Christian people and we have to destroy the Christianity. He said, then what happened? Hundreds and hundreds of Christians, hundreds of hundreds of, uh, I mean, I mean even, even Roman people also, they died during the time of Nero. So that is in the history. And next one, the next uh, two emperors are there. That is, I mean, uh, Vespasian, Vespasian and Titus. Vespasian and Titus. Vespasian and Titus. Even they did not insist them for Caesar worship. Both of them, Vespasian and Titus, they did not insist the people for Caesar worship. Okay, then the last one. That is the Emperor Domitian. The Emperor Domitian, his ruling period was from AD 81 to 96. AD 81 to 96. That is Emperor Domitian. You know who he was? He was the cold blooded persecutor. He was the cold blooded persecutor. 
and he is known as the devilish emperor he is known as the devilish emperor and he is known as the saint devil saint devil means uh, what is the vivegam illa vivegam illatha sada okay pishadi he, he is known like that saint devil saint devil or he is known as the devilish emperor called the blood persecutor or something because he was just i mean without any passion without any mercy he was persecuting all the christians in, in his time and he started to persecute the jews and also christian he started to persecute the jews and christian and he enacted himself as god and informed all that they must say our lord and god your mission he was trying to tell to the people that himself he said i am the god domitian said the emperor roman emperor or domitian said i am the god and whenever you say something you have to say our lord and god domitian so he was saying i am the lord and god so you have to say our lord and god domitian so during his time during his time john was banished to island of patmos during the time of domitian john apostle john was banished to the island of patmos okay so we were just thinking about the reasons of the destruction of the churches or the christianity in those days what was that number one the persecution the persecution okay and secondly the main, the second point was caesar worship caesar worship and the coming of the the the, the roman emperors and they influenced these people and also these people were i mean i mean going down and down and many were killed and many were i mean ban I mean, banished from the, the 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 world and all those things so even even uh, uh, john also was banished to the island of patmos in the time of during the time of emperor domish next one diversions the next reason is diversions you know diversions happen both in the lifestyle and in the belief system of the christian people because of all these reasons diversions from from the real truth of the bible and diversions in the lifestyle and in the belief system also you know the first century churches were not all not at all giving uh, importance to the building you know that the first century i mean uh, uh, century churches the, or the apostles or the leaders or the christians they were not giving more importance for the building they were gathering uh, in houses and under the tree or somewhere you know those days they had a spiritual thirst for worship the situation was like that so no apostles or leaders said i am the king or i am the leader and all the believers must obey me if you not obey me you will be tortured you know the the, the apostle the, the the mentality of the apostles and the mentality of the leaders and the mentality of the christians in those days was different you know but what happened the diversions are happening in the belief system and in the lifestyle and in the in their belief and in the in the in the culture also you know in the first century time the christians were different the leaders were different the apostles were different you know no apostle said okay i am the king or i am the leader you have to obey me otherwise you will be tortured okay it was not there but later it happened even they were not giving importance for the system but for the spirituality and edifying one another with word of god they were all humble serving humbly serving god that means they were not giving a quarter for the system that means how we are worshiping or how we are doing this thing and that thing there was no time for the to 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 think about all those things but they were always giving the importance for the spirituality and whenever they were gathering together they were trying to edify one another with the word of god encouraging others with the word of god spreading the gospel sharing the word of god and they were humbly serving god it was not like uh, 
the, the, the leaders of the apostles or the pastors like today. You know, it is already changed. Those days also, in the, in the first century, all those people were having the spiritual, I mean, awakening. And they were edified. Whenever they gathered together, whenever they sing a song, whenever they just, I mean, pray, they all people will be edified. And they are engaged, encouraged by the word of God. And they were exhorting one another. Okay, and all the, uh, they were giving the importance for the spirituality. But what happens today for the New Testament church, the, 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 the Protestant churches today? They are giving more importance for the system. There is no spirituality in the worship sometimes. There is no spirituality. There is no influence of the Holy Spirit in the, in the worship sometimes. They are looking for the system. Okay, that things and these things. Okay, everything is good. The same thing is happening today also. In our churches, you know, there were no priests in the in the New Testament church in those days. Have you ever read uh, in the Bible that there, there was some priest in the New Testament church? Never, never, never. There was no priest in those days in the New Testament church. So New Testament teaches about fivefold ministries, ministers of the church. Who are those? Fivefold ministers of the church. Apostles. Prophets, pastors, pastors or bishops or shepherds, three are same, pastors or bishops or shepherds, then evangelists, then teachers, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. These are the fivefold ministers in, it is written in book of Ephesians. Okay, so they didn't have any, 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 any special garments of priestly gown to do the ceremonies or ministries in those days. I'm talking about the first century Christianity, first century Christians, the apostolic time. They were not having any special garments or priestly gown, just like today. You know, they, they were doing all the ceremonies and they were doing all the ministries in those days. And when you read Acts chapter, chapters one, two, three, and all those chapters, you will understand all those things. They were in a special People. They were a special people worshiping God, only giving importance to worship God and to be strong in the word of God. They were not looking for all other ex I mean, external things. They were internally, they were very strong. Okay, but at the same time, the Bible says we all are royal priests and kings. There is no special king or there is no special priest in the New Testament church. We all are royal priests and we all are royal kings. Another thing, there was no politics in the church and divisions among the believers. There were no politics in the church, divisions among the believers. Of course, there were uh, divisions uh, among the believers of Corinthian church. Corinthian church, it is written in Bible, okay, about uh, the Corinth church. There were some kind of divisions. At the same time, generally, generally, they were all when working uh, uh, unanimously with the purpose of winning more souls and equipping them for the coming of Jesus Christ. Always they were talking. Whenever they gathered together, they were, I mean, they were thinking and they were I mean, speaking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus is coming soon. We have to be prepared enough. We have to be ready for that. And they were so engaged in winning more souls. They were engaged with the spreading gospels to the other people. And they had no time for politics in Christianity. There is no time for division in the Christianity. But today what is happening? It's a, it's a, it's a pathetic situation there. Painful situation today happening in all our churches. There are many politics in the church, inside the church, and divisions are there. There are many problems happening. But that is the that is one reason that our church, the Christian churches are going down and down and down. What happened? But, but later, even today, the same thing is happening. The fellowship of the church became the established organizations and denominations. Right? Today, what is happening? Our churches and fellowships, small groups of churches became big establishment and organizations and denominations. And sometimes, just like a ritualistic worship system. Our worship is just like a ritualistic 
worship system. We have a system that we should do this like this and do like that and do these things. There is no power of the Holy Spirit. There is no influence of the Holy Spirit. Influence, I mean, Holy Spirit is not doing some anything in some of the churches when they are worshiping. There is no freedom for the Holy Spirit. There is no freedom to worship the Lord. You know, everything became a ritual. You know, the priests and the leaders took more authority later in the first centuries. After the first century, the priests and the leaders took more authority and politics came inside the church and the churches became the business center also. Later, what happened? There was no priority for Jesus, but priority has been given for Mother Mary and the other so-called saints. No, the apostles never said, after my death, you, uh, you all must proclaim that this man is a saint of God. But the people made them saints and they started to pray to the statue of those apostles as an intercessory prayer. Let me tell you one thing. This is one reason that the Christianity was going down and down and defeated by the other people. They were not strong. Many things happened. Many false teachings came inside the church. Politics came inside the church. Many things were added. In the first century, there was nothing. They were all gathering together and worshiping God in spirit and defying others and encouraging others and exhorting others and worshiping, only worshiping and listening to the word of God and getting ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, even though this is a class, let me tell you, I mean, one thing that when Satan is walking something inside the church, he will bring some divisions in, inside the church. But we, the believers, we, the Christians, should not allow any false teaching, any, I mean, I mean, uh, divisions inside the church. Then only we will be standing firm for the name of Jesus Christ. So these are the reasons that uh, the, the Christians of these, those days, they were defeated and they were destroyed by the other influences. And the next one is the, the, the extreme love to Jesus made many of them to attract the idol worship. The idol worship. You know, the pagan worship and the, the Roman emperors influenced all these people to do something, to worship in this way or that way, or worship a man, worship a Caesar, the emperor. You know, when they were, so some of the people, some of the Christians, they were having more extreme love towards Jesus Christ. Okay, so what happened after the death of Jesus Christ, they were just thinking, okay, now we don't have, physically we cannot see Jesus, but we need somebody to look when we worship God. So when we go to the temple or when we go to the church, we have to see something. We have to see some statue or we have to see some pictures. Then only we can worship. So the extreme love towards Jesus made them to attract the idol worship. They started to make some idols and they started to worship the idols. So this is the diversion happening. Diversion. Diverted from the truth of the Bible. So that is what happening in that in those days. Hallelujah. So let me let me let me tell you one thing now. So before we get into the chapters and the deep meaning of every topics and the eschatological events, as I told you, it is very difficult. It is very tough to understand all the all the all the meanings and the, of the mysteries of the Book of Revelation. At the same time, we need to pray for the wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit to rightly interpret the word and to grasp the things in a proper way. Amen. Hallelujah. So we are going to enter to the chapter one. So before that, before we get into the into the to the I mean uh, to the first chapter, let us look unto the Lord in prayer. And I request uh, I mean uh, brother I mean Suman to lead us in prayer now, just before we enter into the chapter one, because we need the wisdom of God, we need the power of God, we need the influence of the Holy Spirit. To, to enter into the chapter one because there are many, many, I mean, mysteries written in the book of Revelation. The angel raised to John, okay, last, finally, the revelation given to John about many things. So John's intimacy with God 
made him to receive the revelation. You know, God is always revealing his truth to the people who are close to him. Who are close to him. John, Apostle John was very close to God. And he was always praying and he was always, I mean, seeking the will of God and always, I mean, <clears throat> looking forward for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's the reason that he was writing the letters. In, in all the letters, he was speaking about Jesus Christ. He was writing about Jesus is the Lamb of God and Jesus is the Word and Jesus is coming soon. So that's the reason that God is revealing his truth to the people who are close to him, close to him. For example, you know, when uh, you read Genesis chapter 18, uh, uh, verse 17, Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, it says like this, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Okay, then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? That means God decided to destroy, destroy the Sodom and Gomorrah. Eh? But not to all, he revealed all those things. But only revealed only for the Abraham who had a close relationship with God. So we have to understand one thing. If you are close with God and you have a close relationship with God, I mean, hallelujah, the God will reveal the heavenly mysteries of the word of God to you. I mean, so let us all be close unto the Lord and let us all, I mean, I mean, know that God's presence is always with us and whenever we are close with us, God is able to reveal the, I mean, mysteries of the word of God towards the people of God, those who are so close to us. So let us come closer unto the Lord and always let us pray to the Lord, oh Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need the, I mean, wisdom and understanding to know, to grasp all those things in my, in my life. Hallelujah. So let us all, I mean, close our eyes in the presence of God and let us, I mean, pray one, one second. Hallelujah. I mean, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful evening time, oh God. We thank you for bringing us together in your presence of God. And thank you for, I mean, giving all these verses, oh Lord. I mean, even though, I mean, all the churches in that area, I mean, were banished, I mean, vanished, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Disappeared, oh God. I mean, because of the persecution and many other reasons, oh God. This morning, this evening, we pray that, Lord, let your power and let your presence be upon every one of us, oh God. Hallelujah. As we are, I mean, I mean trying to go through the, I mean, I mean verse by verse study, of oh God. Hallelujah. Of the book of, book of uh, Revelation. We pray that, Lord, we need your wisdom, oh God. We need your understanding, oh God. Hallelujah. We are not able to understand all the mysteries of the word of God with our own intellectual capacity, oh God. Hallelujah. We have the limitation, of oh God. Hallelujah. We need the power of God. We need the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit to, to go through all those truths of God. Hallelujah. We commit ourselves in the mighty hand of God. We pray for each and every one of us. I mean, we pray the Lord. Let everyone be blessed by the word of God. Hallelujah. We bless everyone in the mighty name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. This evening, oh Lord, we thank you for gathering us together in your presence to have this Bible study, oh God. We thank you for everything, especially we pray for the people, those who are not able to I mean, attend for this Bible study. Bless them and be with them, oh God. Hallelujah. As we are just this person from here, be with us and guard us, oh God. And we pray for the Sunday service also. Bless that service, oh God. Bless the servant of God who is I'm going to praise the word of God. Bless him, oh God. Hallelujah. I mean, bring us everyone. I mean, gather us everyone, oh God, in, in, into the sanctuary of God to worship the Lord in truth the spirit of God. We come it out with the mighty hand of God. Thank you for hearing a prayer, oh God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. May the love of Father, grace of Son, Jesus Christ, come in the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.